Yeah, 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 yeah. Therefore, God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, everything should bow, everything on the earth, everything under the earth, everything above the earth, and proclaim that he is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Praise the Lord, and he is, and he is. Oh, my goodness, man. I tell you, we've been in Philippians, and uh, good night. I don't know about you guys, but it has just been, it's been, it's been, I, I hear you, brother. He's been messing with me, too. I guarantee you, the Lord has just opened up some avenues to uh, speak to my heart through Philippians. It's just been amazing how, um, you know, a lot of times you, as a pastor, and, and you're always trying to hear the Lord and listen to the Lord and what he would have you to do and preach and say to the, to the people that you're pastoring and you try to be responsive to that and, 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 and pay attention. And if you're not careful, and, and even if you are careful, a lot of times you'll kind of get into certain patterns of things that you deal with and things that you know are, are, are uh, concerning to you and so forth. And so you, you end up over a period of time doing familiar things uh, just in different ways uh, over and over. And, uh, and, and that's not a criticism to anybody. That's just, you know, the way things go with, the, with our lives. But when you go through a book, uh, you're stuck with whatever comes next. I mean, it's like uh, whether you want to share that or not, that's what's next. And uh, unless you're going to skip over it and excuse it in some way, <laughs> yeah, Bev, there it is. And so you're going to have to deal with a lot of things. And, and, and so in going through a book, it carries you and it sometimes drags you, you know. Sometimes it drags you through some things that are um, really, really good for you, some things you need to know. I, I also have been thinking in connection with, uh, with, with Philippians. It, it just started because I felt compelled to get in this book and, and, and just preach through this book um, it, it, and... I, for, I have forgotten, I've been with the Lord for 44, 46 years. I've been with the Lord for 40, right at 46 years. And I know that's shocking because I look so young, but, oh, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I have been with the Lord for 46 years. I've been pastoring for like 43 of those years or, or so, roughly, and, or more. And, and so I, for, I have forgotten what built me and what shaped me to be the person that I, that I am now. Uh -huh. It's easy to overlook those things uh -huh. and, and somehow think that they're not important or vital for people's lives to develop. And so when you go back through a book like this, you get to share things that are foundational in, in your belief system. Uh -huh. Things that that, sh that shape you and mold you and, and, and are a foundation that God can take and build other things that may be or may seemingly be more dynamic and more exciting and all of that. But there has to be a foundation for that kind of stuff to, to, to hang on or else it's, it's not going to be strong. It's, gonna, it's just as strong as its foundation is. Yeah. And you may be able to jump and shout and yell and scream and praise and do all of that stuff, but you don't really know why, you know. It's like, well, all right, good. Uh, but when you, you hear things about, uh, about Christ and his crucifixion and his suffering and, his, and, and the Holy Spirit working in your life and filling you, empowering you, carrying you forward, the Word of God, the Bible, the Word of God impacting you in ways that nothing else can impact your life, those are foundational things. Those are the things that we believe that everything is based on in our lives, based in our Christian lives, our church. And um, it's, it's really easy to overlook that as if everybody already knows all that. And I know that we don't uh, because there are times when, when you may have a puzzling look at something that's seemingly very simple. And you go like, what? I Never heard that before. Well, well, uh, that's an indictment, really, uh, to your pastor for not teaching you those kind of things. And so I'm, gonna, you know, I'm enjoying this. Is what I'm saying to you. I'm enjoying it. I enjoyed last week. What's so special about Jesus? 
Uh, yeah, what is so special about Jesus anyway? Why the big hoopla? Why all the big fuss about Jesus and all of that? And it was last week, and then we dealt with, you know, uh, dealing how to enjoy people, which is uh, something that we all have in our life, how to reduce conflict, which is really great information to have and great things to know. And today, I know if, you've, if you got the, note, you, uh, the notes that I made for you, you, you see what today, God's part, my part in changing me. You know, I've been in church, like I said, and, uh, as a Christian for 43 years. I didn't grow up in church. I mean, I was like 13 years old when I started going to church, uh, other than a few little sporadic uh, spitters and sputters here and there. But really, uh, I started going to church when I was about 13 uh, on a regular basis, didn't know anything. I wasn't a Christian, didn't know a Christian, didn't have any Christians in my life. None of my friends were Christian. And um, I had a friend that invited me to a church uh, picnic kind of a deal. And when I was 13, and I said, yeah, I'll go. And then there were some other young people there, and they were my age, and they seemed to like me, and I needed that at that time, and uh, as we all do. And I needed a peer group. I needed some people to be with and some people that were like-minded and so forth, and they became that. And, um, and I kept going, and the Lord saved my soul, changed my life, Worked in me in so many, many ways. It's unbelievable. And, and, it, and it all happened in a very simple way that God began to move in my life. All through my teenage years, thank you, Nathan. All through my teenage years, I would hear at meetings, you know, you, you'd have revival meetings. Is it, do any of you remember revival oh, meetings? Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. Revival meetings. You'd have a week of revival or two weeks of revival. And you'd have a special guest preacher there that was on fire from the Lord, and, you know, and he would get up there and he would just, man, he would just put it on us, you know. Yeah, he would get us because he wasn't our pastor, so he could say anything he wanted to to us, you know, because he was, he was leaving in a few days. So, it, you know, he, he didn't mind telling us a bunch of bunch of stuff we needed to hear, you know. And, and so anyway, uh, I remember, and I can remember people stand up and testify. And, you know, there used to be times where people would stand up and testify. Of course, we, we still have a little bit of it now, but, but not, not as much as we used to. And people stand up and, and people would just say things like, I tell you what, Pastor, the Lord has changed my my life. Uh -huh. And, you know, as a teenager, I would hear that. And, and here's what I would wonder. I would wonder, how did he do that? Do do I mean, I heard you say it, and I know you, and I know you have changed. But what I want to know is, how did, that, how did he change your life? How did that happen? You know, did he zap you with a lightning bolt? I'm, I mean, I, you know, I've come to the Lord, but I've never been zapped with a lightning bolt. Maybe that's what I'm missing. I could really be what I'm really supposed to be. Or, or did he just kind of uh, come in and, and, and wipe your brain and brainwash you, you know, and maybe just cleanse you and take out all that old nastiness? Stuff? But that's never happened to me that way, you know. Or maybe he twisted your arm till you cried, Uncle, you know, what we used to play and. Man, I mean, what did God do to change you like you're talking about? And you know something? As an adult, I'm almost as confused about it now, uh, about what God does to change people's lives like the testimony testifies that their lives have been changed. And I've seen people's lives change. Well, the good news is that uh, God tells us how our lives change right here in Philippians. He tells us in Philippians in these next couple of verses here exactly how he goes about changing people. He says, you know what? There is, there is a part that I play because I, I've heard and asked the question, I mean, change, is it all up to God? I mean, does God do it all? Because you've heard things, you know, people would tell you, hey, just wait on the Lord, brother. Wait on the Lord. Uh -huh. yeah. And, and what, would you, what does that mean? That, that means just, all right, wait on the Lord. He's going, that means I don't do anything and he does everything and I just wait on him, right? All right. Are some of you, have some of you waited on the Lord? Are you, are you still waiting? Is it, is it come? That's kind of a passive approach. And then, then there would be other people that would be very aggressive and you would hear them say things like, hey, if it's, if it's to be, it's up to me, man. I got to get out there and, and, and get in the wilderness for God. I got to walk on, got to march on. God's a God of forward march. I don't need... And, and so, you know, is it, is it marching on or is it waiting on the Lord? Uh -huh. yeah, I mean, you see the confusion here. The confusion is we hear so many statements about how God grows us up, 
we're left confused about do I do I go forward and, and push myself or do I just sit here and wait? And I, I don't know. And, and, and Paul, Paul, the Apostle Paul evidently had this in mind and the Holy Spirit had this in mind when he, when he encouraged Paul to pen these next couple of verses that we come to out of Philippians chapter 2 in, in mind. And look at what he says here. Therefore, my beloved, now this comes at the end of all of that stuff about Jesus and about being the name above all names and that the name of Jesus, every knee bow and tongue confess and all, comes right at the end of the last passage we read last week. These are the next verses, verse 12. Therefore, based on all of that stuff that I've said about Jesus and everything, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Paul says it's more important than ever that you obey what I say because I'm not there now. I can't, I'm not there to straighten you out. I'm not there to correct you. So you're going to need to remember what I said, and it's more important than ever that you do that now. So as you've always done, then notice what he says. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, when you see fear and trembling, you know that God's not wanting you to be afraid of him, right? I mean, we think of the word fear as being, you know, horrified or, or scared, but the word fear here in the scripture means with respect, with honor, uh, with, a, with a reverential awe, with a respect for the greatness and the power of God. And notice he says that you are to work out your own. In other words, this is personal. This is not groupthink. This is not cookie cutter Christianity right here. Paul says, you have a salvation. And even though the salvation you have doesn't belong to you, it belongs to God and God gave it to you, you have a personal relationship with God and that your Christian life is not a matter of imitating other people. It's not a matter of saying, that's a great person, let me act just like him. Or Jesus did wonderful things, let me act like Jesus acted. Christianity and growth in the Lord is not a matter of of imitation, it's a matter of habitation. It's a matter of being inhabited by Christ, being inhabited by the Spirit of God so that the Spirit of God compels those things out of me. I'm not trying to act my way into heaven. I act the way I act because heaven's on the inside of me. And so he's saying, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So I just want you to know two phrases here to start with. Notice the phrase, work out, and notice the phrase, work in. Yeah, yeah. All right, when it, comes to, when it comes to growing with Christ, when it comes to changing your life, if there was one thing that you could change in your life, what would it be? Don't answer out loud. But what, what, what would it be? Uh, the verses say that, that I have a responsibility, that I am supposed to work out some things, and that God has a responsibility, and he's responsible to work in certain things. So in actuality, the verse is saying, I am to work out what God has worked into me. Notice that he does not say work for. It, it, there are many people that are confused by that. All right. they, they think that, that, that they need to do certain things continuously in order for God's salvation to remain in their life and for them to be close to the Lord. He, Paul doesn't say anything about working for salvation. He says, I work out what God's worked in, and God works in what he wants so that I not only have the will to do it, I not only want to do it, but I have the power to accomplish that which he has put in me to want to do. For it is God who works in you both to will and give you the ability to do that good thing that he's put in your heart. But there's no for there. And, and the reason why is because... Th Four is, is out of the question when it comes to my relationship with God. Let me just show you why. There's one verse. Says, I don't have, well, do I have it on the screen? I might have. I'm sorry. Yes, I do. I'm, I'm more smarter than I thought. Look at this. Ephesians 2. Now, now, this is it. Look at this. This is us in Christ. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. 
and that not of yourselves. In other words, you have been saved through faith, and the faith that saved you doesn't even belong to you. In other words, if God didn't give you enough faith to believe him for salvation, you wouldn't even have enough on your own to believe to even be saved to start with. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that faith is not of yourselves, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. In other words, you can't work this up. You can't do good enough. Because if you could, then you would be responsible for your salvation and your relationship with God, and you would be able to boast about this thing. It would be like, oh, wonderful me, great me. I'm a spiritual person. I got it. No, Christ says, when it comes to this, it's, this is what I do. This is what I do in you. And, and, so, and so working out and working in is, is much different than working for. Notice the last, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Why did Christ create us? For good works. Is there anybody confused about what good works means? Good works means what? Good works. Good works means I do good stuff. Good works means I think good stuff. Good works mean, means I plan good stuff. I, I, I desire good stuff. I, I want good stuff for others. That's why Christ saved our soul and created our life. What? For good works. So that the kingdom of God, which God prepared beforehand, that we all should walk in them. I mean, God doesn't, God doesn't want to punish us and hurt us and, and French fry us and crispy critter us. God wants to bless our lives. God created us in order that he might bless our lives. And we might bless the lives of others. And so that's what we've been created for. And so when it comes to changing, there is... God's part and there is my part. All right, let's look at God's part first. There are three tools that God uses to change your life, all right? And here's the first one, and it won't be any surprise to you, the Bible. This is a tool that God uses to work into you what his purpose is for your life. How many of you, and you don't have to raise your hand because I'm not trying to embarrass anybody or put anybody on the spot, but how many of you could say, I'm telling you what, the Bible changed my life? I mean, reading the Bible has changed my life. It's changed the way I think about things. It's changed the way I look at things. It's changed the way I feel about what's happening in life. You know, I look at one thing and it looks horrible, but then I read verses like, you know, uh, all of these things that happen in our life, God works them for the good because he loves us and he's called us according to his power. And it changes the way I think about things. Because this is a tool that God uses in order to change our lives. An archaeologist was at, <laughs> went over to do some study in Africa. I think it was deep, dark Africa. You know, all these missionary studies are in Africa. I don't know why, but anyway. But he went over, his archaeologist went over, and he found an ancient tribe that nobody had found before, and he was meeting with them, and he said, uh, he, he saw there was a Bible. Somehow they're, they're, they had gotten their hands on a copy of the Bible. And the archaeologist looked at him and said, you need to throw that thing away. That thing's not any good. That thing's not, that, that thing not, it's good for nothing. And the chief looked at him and said, well, it's good for one thing, for you, because if it wasn't for that Bible, you'd be in that pot right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, Bible, the Bible's intended to make a difference, right? I say it every day. I say it every Sunday, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. What does that mean? That means that our faith is built by hearing out of the Word of God, yeah. not out of somebody's uh, uh, adventures in life or somebody's point of view or somebody's politics. or so. No, our lives are changed by the Word of God. The Bible is God's tool. Now, let me just ask you, do you ever read it? Oh, yeah. I mean, do you read it and say, God, speak to me in this. God, teach me in this. I want my life to honor you. I want to be what you've called me to do. I want to know what you would have me do in my life. And then just read and let God speak to you through the Bible, the Word of God. We call it a book, but it's really not a book. It's really a library of books. It's 66 books written over a period of several thousand years by at least 40 different authors that didn't even know each other, didn't know the other one wrote, didn't have a copy of what they wrote, and yet God put it together to touch our lives. 
Hebrews 11 says what? Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So it says faith is the thing that hope stands on. Faith is the substance of things that I hope for. So see, you come into church, I can't give you hope. I can talk about hope. I can put things forward and, and, and want you to grab them and have hope in life. But you have to have hope. <laughs> I started to sound like Johnny Cochran or somebody. You have to have hope to cope, you know. You, you know. <laughs> without hope, you can't cope. And that's exactly right. Have you ever met anybody without hope? Have you ever been around anybody without hope? Man, they're desperately miserable people, aren't they? You don't want to be around people that have no hope, right? You want to get away. Man, God wants us to have hope. And so what he does, he, he can't give us hope. We have, to, we have to latch on to hope. We have to choose hope. Yeah, yeah. But what he can do is he can work on your faith. Yeah. He can work on what hope stands on. So how does he work on what hope stands on? Our faith is the substance. Like this stage is my substance. I'm standing on it. It holds me. The stage is the substance of Pastor Keith so he can preach the word. Faith is the substance that your hope bounces up and down on. And how do we get faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So it is the word of God that your hope stands on. Not the book of the month or the book of the year or the magazine of the, of the, of the quarter. This is the word of God, and it is a tool that God uses. Make, take advantage of it, all right? Here's the second one, all right? This one might not surprise you either. All scripture given by inspiration of God. That's just a verse about, out of 2 Timothy 3. is a wonderful verse about what the Bible does. It gives us, look, it says it's profitable for what? For doctrine. What is doctrine? Doctrine is what we believe. The Bible tells us what we believe for reproof. What does reproof mean? Repro reproof means knowing what's right. You know, it teaches me what I believe. It teaches me what is right in my life. It straightens me out for correction. And then it gives me instructions on how to go about living right. This is a, this is a, this is a Holy Spirit book, man. This is the Word of God. Here's the second thing. It's Holy Spirit. These are tools now that God uses. We said God has a part and we have a part. God's part is to work in. I have a part to work out. How does God work in? The Bible, he works in you through his word. He works in you through his Holy Spirit now. And I know this, that's probably not a new concept, but, but when you come to Christ, God actually places himself on the inside of you. I mean, that's what he says. He says, look, when you come to me, I'm going to inhabit you. I'm going to indwell your life. Remember when Jesus was about to leave the earth and the disciples were all sad about it? And he said, look, don't let your heart be troubled. He said, I I'm going away, but I'm going to send a comforter, is what he said. Now, that word that's translated comforter, Greek, a parakletos, from which we get the word paraclete which we don't use anymore, but if we did use it, what you would know about the word paraclete would be one just like him. A paraclete means not somebody just to fill the gap. It means somebody just like him in every way. Just Jesus said, I am sending someone just like me who will be with you and be in you. And so the Holy Spirit occupies the inside of our life in order for God to work in the things that we need. Look at this verse. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Now, I've heard people say, man, that, you know, that, that mystical, magical stuff about the Holy Spirit indwelling your life, that's ridiculous. Well, not to the Bible. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And why does the Holy Spirit indwell you? Why would he do this? But if the Spirit who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. In other words, he's talking about spirit. He's talking about spiritual life. We need spiritual life. We have old human life, but we don't have spiritual life until the Holy Spirit comes and inhabits our heart and gives life 
to us. Why would he do that? Because he wants to recreate us in the image of Jesus. You say, oh, Pastor, you're going off the deep end. Mm. Well, I might be. <clears throat> but um, one of these days we'll stand before the Lord, won't we? Uh, just just a, a verse, and I, I don't have it on a, on a slide, but, I, but you'll know it because we say it all the time. Everybody in here says this verse all the time. For we know Romans 8, 28. This is Romans 8, 11. About 17 verses later comes 8, 28, obviously. So it's in the same, it's even in the same chapter as this. For we know that all things work to the good of those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. Do you know the next verse? The next verse says, for whom he did foreknow. Now, foreknowing something is not predestination. Just because I know what's going to happen doesn't mean I determine that it happens. I know my son. Do you like spinach now, by the way? Well, <laughs> he used to not like spinach, but he likes a lot of stuff. But, but I, I knew he didn't like spinach. I put spinach on the table. I know in advance he's not going to eat spinach. Now, did I make him? No, I put it there. I said, have some, but I know he's not going to do it because I know him, and I know he doesn't like that. So, so verse 29 says, for whom he did foreknow, them he did also predestine to, to what? Am I predestined to be saved? In other words, no matter what, I'm going to be saved if I'm predestined to be saved. Or if I'm not predestined to be saved, I'm not going to be saved no matter what happens. That's what some denominations teach. That there is a predestination to life. And if you are one of those that are predestined to be saved, you're going to be saved no matter what and if you're not predestined to be saved, you're never going to be saved no matter what. And I'm thinking, why even go to church? Why even, why, I mean, if you're predestined one way or the other, my goodness, that doesn't make any sense. But the point, I'm not trying to make that point. The point I'm trying to make is that he does tell us we are predestined. But what are we predestined to? He says, for them he did, for whom he did foreknow, to them he did predestinate or predestine to be conformed to the image of his son. That's what the verse says. You know what that verse is saying? That verse is saying once we receive Christ into our life, we have said to God, you can do anything to me you want to. And what he has already decided he wants to do is to create you in the image of Christ. And so for the rest of your life, you know what's going to be happening to you? The Holy Spirit is going to be moving in your life to recreate Jesus in you. And I'm not telling you, and don't get whacked out and say, I'm a little Jesus. No, you're not a little Jesus. No, you are not a little Jesus. And we're not even talking about little Jesus. We're talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in every one of our lives so that as long as we live, I'm telling you, if I live to be 120, which I'm thinking, and, and I'm... And I'm and I'm going to die in good health, which means I'm going to just be walking down the road like Enoch was. And all of a sudden, they'll be saying, hey, you said, oh, man, where, where did he go? And he just, it, the Bible says Enoch walked with God and was not. That's what he said, and was not. Like, what, what, what happened? <laughs> he was not. He was there, and he was not. <laughs> and, and, and so I'm going to be like that. I'm just, you say, yeah, well, man, oh, yeah, he just, where is he? He's gone. Well, even if that, even if that happens right there, even if that happens right there, all 120 years I spend on this earth, the Holy Spirit will be trying to recreate Jesus in me right up to the time God takes me out of here, baby, because I don't know about you, but I know I got a long way to go. I mean, thank God I, I'm not what I used to be, but I'm not what I'm going to be either. And until Jesus takes me off this earth, he's going to be working on me. I'm never going to get to perfection. Oh, Jesus is the only perf perfect person that's ever lived, the only one that ever will live. But... He, that doesn't mean that he's not trying to work me toward that. That's what the goal of our life is all about, is that the Holy Spirit would change us. And so I'm saying God has a part in changing you. Yep, he works in some stuff with the Bible and then the Holy Spirit. And, then, and, and, and because we don't like to change very much and we don't listen very well, do you know that God would love to do things the easy way? Huh? All right, parents. Parents, let me ask you something. Your parents, your grandparents... When you had your children and, and you were rearing them, you were training them, you were trying to bring them up uh, right, 
did, did you ever talk to them about what was right and what was wrong? And, and why did you do that? Because you wanted them to hear it and then do it, right? You didn't want them to have to learn from experience. You wanted them to hear and learn that you said it. Why can't you learn the easy way? You always have to learn the hard way. This is going to hurt me more than it does you. Yeah, well, I, whatever. But anyway, we get the point. The point is God wants to do things the easy way. You know what God would do? God would love for you to read the Bible and listen to the Holy Spirit and just walk right on in maturity with him. He would love for you to just be, just be tuned right into him and he would just say it and you would just do it and he wouldn't have to do anything else. But you won't do that. Neither will I, so I'm, you know, I'm not trying to point a finger. <laughs> One that way, four fingers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't learn things the easy way. So this brings on the third tool that God has to use, and here it is, circumstances. Circumstances. Oh, my goodness, things happen, don't they? I mean, boy, life really will, will, will happen to you, right? Yeah, some stuff some stuff begins to happen in life. And, 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 you know, I've had people say this, and I don't know how to explain it any other way. I'm trying to just be uh, open about it. I've heard people say, well, you know, God did this and God did that, and there may be some horrible things. You know, God caused my baby to die. God call, caused the wreck I was in. God, and, and I don't really know if people really t believe that totally or whether that's just something that people say that's pain, yeah, and shock. But, but I, I, you know, everything that, this, that the Bible teaches you about God is that he loves you, not that he's trying to get you. Because I tell you, if God was out to get you, you would be got. Because I got news for you. You're not that hard to find. And he can find you. In, where could you go to hide from God? Isn't that what David said? Yep. King David said, where could I go to hide from God? Wherever I go, he's there. Oh, I, that I could fly away and be at rest. Well, if you flew away, you'd still be there, David. So there you go. And if you're there, sin's there, sin's there, Satan's there, sin, you know, I mean, just follow it right on down the line. There's no safe place. No safe place, man. The hippies, <laughs> the hippies flew out of, out of little small cities and went into big cities during the 60s and stuff. No safe place. The people that lived there flew out of there and went out to the suburbs trying to run away from the hippies. No, no safe place, you know. No, there's no safe place to run away from circumstances in life and consequences of choices that you make and certain things like that. And even though I don't believe God causes any evil thing to happen, I do know he knows about it. Now, whether you want to just say that's semantics or not, I mean, I'm with you. Uh, the fact that he knows about it means he could stop it if he wanted to. But he's not stopping it. So, you know, he knows it's not a surprise that it happened. You look at the book of Job, the whole book of Job is about nothing but that. The book starts with an argument between God and Satan. And God and Satan says, God says to Satan, yeah, man, Job is the most righteous man in the world, and he's great. Nah, nah, nah. And Satan says, yeah, you know why? Because you bless him so much. I tell you, if you take away those blessings, he'll curse you to his face. Read the book. It's in the first chapter. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And so what happened to Job, the boils and the skin troubles and the children dying and losing his business and all his money and everything like that, all of that happened because God dared Satan to do something to Job. And, go, and Satan said, I can't do anything. Now, listen to this. This is theology. <laughs> Satan said, I can't do anything to Job because you have a hedge around him. Do you know you have a hedge around you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you didn't have a hedge around you that God put around you, the devil would destroy you. He would tear you to pieces. He would confuse your life. He would... He would make mincemeat out of you. But God has a hedge around you that stops the destroyer. The blood of Christ, the hedge of God. So Satan can't come in and do anything he wants. All he can do is what's outside the hedge. And so Satan, in the book of Job, Satan says, you pull in that hedge, 
and I'll get him to curse you. So God pulled the hedge in, and his children were outside the hedge. Well, Satan went in and killed all the kids, killed all of them, seven sons and three daughters, all grandchildren, all ever. Had a whale of a time. Came back to God. God said, well, what happened? He said, well, I did it. He, well, what did Job do? Uh, nothing. But I tell you what, you draw that thing in tighter, and I'll, I'll, I'll get him this time. So God draws it in a little bit tighter. And what's outside of it? Businesses, his money, his home, possessions, blah, 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 blah. Satan comes in and has a whale of a time, destroys everything. Comes back to God and says, well, okay, what'd you do? Well, I destroyed everything. Well, what did Job do? Well, nothing. nothing. Well, but I'm telling you, if you will just draw that thing in one more time, I'll guarantee you I'll get him to curse you. And so God says, all right. And he draws it in, and the only thing inside the hedge is Job's life. Not his body. He can have sores. He can be sick. He can have broken bones. He can, his body is not in the hedge, only his life. You just can't take his life, that's all. And so what did the devil do? He came in and had a whale of a time. He put sores all over Job's body. He put, you know, torment and torture all over his body. So bad that the Bible says he went out on the city garbage dump and he took shells and he scraped the old wounds, scraped the old nastiness out of those wounds on his body. And God said, yeah, and what did he do? And, and Satan said, he, nothing. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't curse. Blessed the Lord, here's what Job said. The Lord giveth and the Lord takes away. And whether he's given or taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, where did that come from? Yeah, yeah, that's what God's working into you. That's God's part of this whole thing. It's his responsibility to work that into you, to use those tools to work them into you. And so circumstances so often in life are used by God because we don't pay attention. Look, we're fat, happy, and sassy. We don't care what anybody says, right? I mean, Wesley went and did mission work a whole week. And I won't identify the place because I, I don't think anybody up there would be watching, but uh, somebody that knows them might be. But anyway, the, um, it was a long way, and it was real rich people, millionaires. And look, took the kids to Bible school and stuff like that, and, 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 and the kids learned praise songs and Bible stories and all of that kind of stuff. Parents could care less, couldn't, couldn't care less couldn't care less. And even at the closing ceremony, the little kids up there singing praises to Jesus and singing, I believe, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the parents just eating up the little knickknacks and leaving. They don't even care. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they got everything they want. Right? And they got life on a tail by the, uh, uh, life by the tail on a downhill pull. I mean, you know, life's easy for them. But I tell you what will change that. Tragedy. Tragedy will change that. All of a sudden it'll be, it'll be, oh God, you know. And in circumstances of life. And I'm just telling you, God wants to do it the easy way. But sometimes, I mean, we don't always respond to the light, but we always respond to the heat. I can just say that to you. And nothing causes you to change like a little pressure, a little heat on you. So God works things in you yes, this way. How, how many of you have had negative things? And I'm not asking you to raise your hand. But how many of you have negative things that have happened that you thought were almost the end of the world only to find out that God used that to be one of the greatest moments in your life? Yeah. It changed everything in your life and you wouldn't change one thing about it. It was like, God, why didn't you do it sooner? You know? That's all I can say. All right, that's God's part. Now, what about my part? Oh, th look at this. This is a verse uh, talking about suffering. For it was fitting for him for whom all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation. Who is that? Jesus. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. I'm just, I put that verse up there to remind me to tell you uh, if Jesus was made perfect, and that doesn't mean that he was made God. It means he was made mature. He was made qualified. Just think qualified. Jesus was qualified through suffering. 
I just wanted to say to you that if, it, if Jesus had to be qualified through suffering, how do you think you're going to be qualified? All right, there we go. That's just, all right, here's my part. You said, I said, I, we have a part. Our part's to work out what God works in. God works in stuff, we let it work out of us. That's what it means. Number one, I can choose what I think about. That's my part. I can choose what I think about. Yeah. You know, uh, there's a verse, uh, let me put it up there, and I've got it, I've got it uh, a little paraphrase that I wrote under it. So if you're copying down something in and and, and that little bottom part, that's not scripture. That's just my thoughts about it, all right? Let's paraphrase. The top is the word. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. To me, that says be careful how you think because your whole life is affected by your thoughts. I says be careful what you think about. Be careful what you put your mind on. Because what you think you are, I wrote this in the notes, what you think you are, you are not what you think, but what you think you are. You'll have to look at it written down. It'd be, be far more impressive. You know? Yeah, yeah. What we think about is us. It, 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 it changes. All right, what I think about changes the way I feel, right? I mean, if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm thinking about something positive, I, I have an uplifted spirit. I'm happier. I'm a little perky. I, I have a good uh, optimistic view of life. If I'm thinking negatively, if I'm thinking, oh, this is a terrible thing. You'll never, I'll never get over it. All right, then I'm going to be like Eeyore walking around, you know, and, and oh, woe is me. Everything that happens is woe is me. Yeah. It, but what is that? That's the way I'm thinking. You know, we talk about around here, uh, let's stop this stinking thinking. Yeah, yeah, unscriptural, unfaith-filled, ungodly thinking, you know, stinking thinking. Well, if, I, if I'm thinking like that, I'm going to be down. It affects the way I feel. I'm just saying that to show you the way you feel affects what you do. So if I want to change what I do, what do I need? I need to change what I think. And so I have the option to choose what I think about and what I put my mind on. What does the scripture say? Think about things that are lovely and, and of good report. And if they have any value, any virtue, any love, if they're high, you think on these things. <laughs> Sitting on the edge of night without a guiding light, trying to search for tomorrow. Got caught up in a secret storm as sure as the world turns. My life is just another soul. <laughs> Can't think of all that. All right, there we go. All right, here we go. Here's the second thing. Now, this is my part. I choose what I think about. Number two, I choose to depend on God's Holy Spirit. I make a choice to do this. Uh, the Bible, we, a while ago I said, how many of you, the Bible has changed your life and, and the Spirit of God working in you has changed you? Well, here's how this happens. Look at this. This is out of John 15. How many of you remember John 15? I preached on it a whole bunch. Um, yeah, uh, I know you do, so you don't have to raise your hand. Uh, uh, John 15, verse 4, look at it. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Bearing fruit means uh, producing things. That's what that stands for. I mean, it's, it's an, an analogy, you know, about vines and bearing fruit and blah, blah. But it's really talking about what you do with your life is what this is really talking about. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. You got a little old branch sitting out here and, and it's not attached to anything. It's just a little dry, brittle branch. Is it going to produce anything? Is any fruit coming off of that? Not a drop. All right. Unless it uh, uh, cannot bear fruit in itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? All right, the Holy Spirit's filling your life. If there's no Holy Spirit in you, if there's no work of God in you, you are not attached to a vine. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Do you believe this? I believe this. I don't believe I could do anything worth anything of any value without God working in my life. I mean, I could give money away. I could do some philanthropy and blah, blah. But, but nothing lasting could I do without being attached to the vine. I mean, think about it this way. If I, if I came to Tanya today after church and I said, baby, you know, I've been wanting some apples. And I tell you what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plant us an apple tree and, I'm, and this fall we're going to have some apples. 
And then I went out and I got an old apple tree that had been cut down. I took it in the yard and I stuck it in the ground. And then along about the time where apples are supposed to be getting ripe and coming in and doing all good, I get me, go up to the grocery store and I buy me a bunch of apples. And I, and I get me a little twine and I hang them on that little tree out there. And then I bring Tanya out and I say, here, baby, look at our apple tree. This is awesome. Do you think she would be impressed with that? <laughs> then why do we do that? That's what we try to do with God. We, he says, stay attached to me. You'll have the real thing. But we're trying to do good things to show how worthy we are. And so it's like going up to the grocery store and buying an apple and hanging it on an old dead limb out here. It looks just as silly as that. Trying to prove ourselves good and make ourselves valuable and, and righteous with God. Same old silly stuff as that. The Holy Spirit keeps us attached. And I can choose to rely on the Holy Spirit's work in my life. Or I can live merrily along as if there is no Holy Spirit. It's my choice. See, i got to work these things out. These things are what's supposed to come out of my life. And here's the last tool. I can choose how I react to circumstances. All right, I know you see the picture. The picture is God uses the Bible, God uses the Holy Spirit, and God uses circumstances to work things into me. I have a responsibility to take the things that he works into me and allow those things to work out into my life. So when he works it in, I choose to let it out. I choose to cooperate with it. I choose to reflect it in life. Now, now, now back to the first question. Uh, if there was one thing you could change in your life, what would it be? Let's go back to that question. You really want it? Can you choose it? I mean, you can't choose, okay, I want to be born all over again, you know. <laughs> this time to a rich family, you know. I want to live, I want to, I want to, I want to be born, Brother Keith's the house, you know, he's Cotton Candy Lane and Bubblegum Alley down here. Life, you know, anointing oil flows out of my mouth and sweetness out of my eyes. Well, you can't do that, but now other stuff, you know, uh, your love, your joy, your peace, your gentleness, your long-suffering, your kindness, greatness, meekness, self-control, I mean, all of that. Want, it, want, it, want that to change? Well, the good news, it can, because God can work that into your life. That's what he's working for, but you have to make a choice. You choose. That's exactly right. You choose what you want to do. I'm telling y'all, I looked at Billy, because Billy helps me preach, and Brian, several y'all do. And, um, and y'all just don't know Billy. I'm serious. I mean, it, if uh, back years ago, I've known him many years. Years ago, boy, he was, he was tough, man. I mean, <laughs> he was tough. He was tough to be around, even, and you loved him. But I'm going to tell you, well, but... <laughs> But isn't, but isn't he better, Brian? Isn't he better? That was what I was going to say. I was going to end up bragging on you, brother. I'm serious. Brian, you just be quiet. That's right. You just be quiet. <laughs> but, it, yeah, but, but, now, but now he's chosen. He made some choices uh, to, to be different and to choose to be different. And that's working out what Christ has worked in. And I'm just telling you, that happens with all of us. You don't have to sit here saying, I wish, I wish, I wish. Choose it. Choose it. And, and, and God changes in your life. All right.